the name of Jesus often. He's above every principality. He's above every power. He's above every problem. And he gives victory in every situation. We need to learn the power of his name. Turn with me in your Bibles this morning to Isaiah chapter 43. And then when you find your place there, turn also with me to Isaiah 41. We'll begin in Isaiah 43. Beginning in verse 1. Now this says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and who formed you, O Israel, fear not. For I have redeemed you, I have called you by your name, and you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you, and through the rivers they shall not overflow you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. Then go with me to Isaiah 41, <clears throat> and in verse 10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. We serve a good God. Amen. I'm thankful that Jesus' name is above every name. His name is above cancer. His name is above sickness. His name is above disease. His name is above problems and situations and conditions. There's no other name given under heaven whereby man can be saved. Last week, I began to tell you how God delivers his people. We spoke on physical and spiritual warfare. I also shared with you the first phase of physical warfare the enemy will usually attack someone in is he'll come after your goods, after your things, and he'll begin to steal and take away from you the things that God has blessed you with. The reason he does that is to get you to chase after the things that God has given you more than staying in relationship with God. We talked about Job and all the blessing that God that came on the life of Job. The devil came before the presence of God and said, God says, where have you come from? And he said, from walking to and fro on the face of the earth. God said to the devil, have you ever considered my servant Job? This is Gen or Job chapter 1. Go with me, Job chapter 1. Have you ever considered my servant Job? He's a righteous man. And the devil says, yes, but you've placed a hedge around him. Remove the hedge of protection and blessing, and he'll be like any other man and curse you. The implication there is very strong. The devil was saying, man only serves you, God, for what he can get from you. And I found that that's the case in many places and many times. But when I begin to chase after the things that the enemy is stealing away from me that God has given me, I'm having to leave the presence of God to go after the things that God has given me. Job made a really wise choice. The enemy came at him one way after another after another. The Bible says that Job was the richest man in all the earth. But the enemy began to steal the blessing of God on the life of Job. He began to take his camels. He had 3,000 camels. He began to take his oxen and his sheep and he took his cattle and he took his camels and he took everything, one thing after another. And it's really interesting because after each item was taken by the enemy, there was always one person left alive to come back and talk to Job. Do you know the nature of man? Misery loves company. And Job was looking at the things the enemy had stolen. He stole his sheep, he stole his camels, he stole his oxen, he stole his female donkeys, he stole everything that he had. But in the absence of the things that he lost, or in the presence of the things that he lost, Job never sinned. 
Job never cursed God. Do you know why Job never cursed God? Because Job didn't leave the presence of God and chase the things that the devil had taken from him. The tendency of man is to go after the blessing of God and lose relationship with God. When we're seeking after the things that the enemy has taken from us more than we're seeking after God, we're seeking the wrong thing. Can I tell you something? That God is not slack concerning his promise. He has abundance and and the things that the enemy stole from you, don't let them draw you out of the presence of God chasing after them. God who is sufficient to give you in the beginning is sufficient to give you again and again and again. So Job said, no, I'm not going to leave the presence of God to go after the things that God has given me. I'm going to stay in the presence of God. There is a very wise choice. Man chases money, possessions, and things. The spiritual man is chasing after God. We need to allow the spiritual man to chase after God. So Job said, no. I'm not going to chase the things. Let's look at this account. Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. The Lord's in verse 8, the Lord said to Satan, If you considered my servant Job, there is none like him in the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? You have made a hedge around him and around his household and around all that he has on every side. You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. That's the blessing of God. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. And there was a day that the sons had of, of Job were feasting and fasting or calling and parting, and there was a day that as they parted, Job would come after the party and he'd pray for his children. He'd call upon them. So the enemy left the presence of God, came down into the life of Job, and began to steal systematically the things that God had blessed Job with. The first thing he stole. <clears throat> was Job's ox. He had a thousand oxen. He stole his donkeys. He had 500 donkeys. The enemy stole it. As the enemy stole it, it says that one person was left alive that came back to Job and began to tell Job all the things that he had lost. The Bible says while that one was still speaking, the next one came to bring a report to Job that the enemy had stolen his 7,000 sheep. And one person was left alive to come back and tell Job of all of his loss. As that one was still speaking, another man came and said, Someone has come and stole your 3,000 camels, and I alone am left. And I've come to tell you of all your calamity and disaster. The same thing happened at the end. When the final man came, he said, I come to tell you the worst news of all. Your children, all ten of them, your seven sons and your three daughters, were partying in the house and the great wind came and blew the house down upon them and they're all gone. What Job did in the face of calamity is a lesson that we in the church need to learn today. Job could have said, curse you God, you gave it but you took it back. I don't like what you're doing. This is not bad. This is not good. Or I'm going to go after my possessions. But to go after the things the enemy steals from you that God has given you, you have to leave the presence of God. And when you leave the presence of God, you're losing sight of God. And when you lose sight of God, you're wandering in a barren land of sin and shame and you're there alone. We need to understand what Job did is what we need to do. We've been taught by the world to chase after things. But God is saying, no, don't do that. Chase after me. God is the high tower and the high song. 
Job laid down in front of God. He ripped his clothes. He put ashes on his head, a sign of mourning and lamenting. And he waited before God and he says he worshiped God. Read the last verse of the first chapter. Job worshiped God. In the midst of his loss, Job worshiped God. Job didn't leave the presence of God to chase after the things that God has given him because Job realized his relationship with God was such that God could give him again. But Job made a great statement. He said, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. That doesn't change who God is. If I have an abundance or if I have lack, It doesn't change who God is because he's still my provider. He's still my deliverer. He's still my savior and he's still my friend. And I'm not serving him for what he has given me. I'm serving him for who he is. He is my God and my savior. Our mind is an amazing thing. Your mind is programmed by God to love. Follow follow with me. Don't lose me on this. Your mind has 86 billion nerve cells. It's an amazing organ in our body. You have enough memory in your mind to last 3,000 years. Your mind runs your whole body. You were told in school and science years ago that you only use 6 to 9% of your mind. That's not true. In the course of a day, we found that we use 100% of our mind. The difference is some of us use it more wisely than others. Mm -hmm. You only have one mind, but each mind has two components or two parts, your conscious mind and your subconscious mind. Your conscious mind is affected and influenced by your five physical senses, what you see, what you smell, what you taste, what you hear. Your your five physical senses control your conscious mind. Your conscious mind, and I've written this down, I want to read it to you carefully. Your conscious mind, oh, whatever you accept in your conscious mind is real or true is given to your subconscious mind to act on, and your conscious mind does all the reasoning and all the thinking and it plants seeds down of whatever it says is is true into your subconscious mind of good or bad. And the the seed that has gone from your conscious mind down into your subconscious mind will determine what the subconscious mind grows. This is really beyond me, but it's absolutely amazing the way God created us. Your subconscious mind controls your physical body. It tells the physical body... To eat, what to eat and digest and to eliminate food. It tells your heart to beat and it tells your lungs to breathe and it never rests and it is always at work. Your subconscious mind is the arena of ideas and urges and dreams based on the information the conscious mind has given it. And you say, well, why are you telling us all this? Because that is exactly the way the enemy works. The reason the devil brought the things to Job to tell him how bad it was is so that Job's eyes would get off of the blessing of God and onto the loss of things. When he gets his eyes off of God and onto the loss of things, the enemy is going to bring Job into an arena that God never intended Job to be in. Too many times we look at the losses of our life as problems and situations that we can't control. And we try to go back and rebuild them and redo them. But that's what the devil wants us to do. He wants us to look at the problems. Because when the problems begin to come in and we begin to meditate on them, we begin to be drawn away from the very presence of God. He wanted Job to see and think that all that was bad that was happening to him was God destroying Job. God wasn't destroying Job, but the Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Have you ever had something negative happen in your life and all of a sudden it begins to try to consume you? It just, it just is there and it's in your face. It just, it just gets bigger the more you think about it. 
you go to bed at night and all of a sudden that which happened during the day is replaying again and again and again in a panorama vision of your mind. You can just see all the aspects of it. You can see every front and back. You can see all the way around it and it's, it's consuming you. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's exactly why the enemy brought one report after another to Job. Because it was dropping from the conscious mind down into his spirit down into the subconscious mind, down into the recesses of his spirit. And the things that were happening that were negative to Joel was affecting him. But, they, but Job said, no, I'm not going to look at things with an outward appearance. I'm going to get my eyes on God. I'm going to seek God because I do not love God for what he has given me. I love him for who he is. Job had a really wise position. He said, I'm not going to look at all these things that I've lost because the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Amen. There are two hands. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Yes. Through it all, blessed be the name of the Lord. If the enemy can get you to looking at the things that you've lost in your life, the bad things, more than you're putting your eyes on the Lord, you're going to be drawn to what you're looking at. You're going to be drawn to the focus of your eye. If you don't believe me, as you're driving home today and you stand seated behind the wheel, look sharply to your left. It works equally well by looking to your right. You'll be drawn to what you're looking at. Job said, no, I'm not going to look at loss. I'm going to look at my provision that comes from God. I'm going to keep my eyes on him. I'm not going to allow the conscious mind, the things that I'm hearing, to drop down into my spirit and control my destiny. So Job refused to follow after the things that he'd been taken by God and he, or by the devil, and he began to fall down and worship God. If we would learn the lesson of Job and begin to worship in the face of adversity, if we would learn to worship in the face of loss, instead of chasing after a physical blessing that's going to be someone else's someday anyway, I began to build an old 1965 Mustang and restore it, and work on it. And one day as I was laying on my back under the car, and oil was dripping on me, and I was in a tight spot, and I couldn't undo the nut that I needed to undo, and I'd sprayed it, and the spray had gotten in my eyes, and it was not comfortable. My back began to hurt, and I began to have twitches in my little toe, and I was trying to get... It came to me. Why am I doing this? Before very long, this isn't going to belong to me anyway. The things that God has given you are going to pass away. But your relationship with God writes your eternal destiny. So when Job chose to follow God rather than pursue the loss of the things, Job made a wise choice. And I submit to you this morning that we need to begin to make that same choice. In America, we're taught that the blessing of the Lord makes rich. But I'm going to tell you the blessing of the Lord is not usually comprised of things and possessions. It's consumed in relationship. And when I'm in relationship with him, I'm not chasing the things. And when I chase the things that the enemy has taken from me, I'm saying, God, you're not as important as the things you've given me. The things you've given me are more important to me, so I'm going to leave you and chase after them. And that's a really wrong choice. And so what I'm realizing today is that God wants to strengthen me in the day of adversity. And if I choose to, like Job, fall down and worship God, I'm going to be blessed by God. I'm going to be blessed by peace and rest and joy in the Holy Spirit. Job made a really wise choice. In fact, at the end of chapter 1, it gives an account of what Job did. All the losses had come. He'd lost everything that God had given him. 
Instead of being the richest man in the land, he was now the poorest man in the land. His ten children were gone. Job sat in nothing. Job sat totally stripped of all that he had. And this is what Job did in verse 20. And Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell to the ground and worshipped. He said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. It's only this brief second in time that things are important to us. And the things that are important to the natural man are not productive to the spiritual nature. And the things that God has given me are not determining my relationship with him. So Job said, I came in with nothing. I'm going out with nothing. Blessed be the name of the Lord. If the loss of things don't get you, the enemy will step up his attack and begin to attack you personally. And that's found in Job chapter 2. The Job began to develop boils on his body. One after another and one on top of another. Boils are very, very painful. I had a boil in my index finger on my right hand one time under, under the fingernail. And I couldn't, my hand was like that big around my finger. It was a big finger. It, it really wasn't, but it felt like it was that big. And oh, that was hot and it hurt and it was painful. Job's whole body was filled with boils. The pain must have been excruciating. Job sat in sackcloth and ashes in a sign of humility, and the boils were continuing to grow. The pain was there. It said he took a piece of pot sheared, which is a piece of ceramic tile broken, and he began to scrape the boils to find some relief of the pain. One thing after another began to happen to Job. Before the comforters came, Job's wife came to him. And she said, Job, why don't you just curse God and die? Are you still going to hang on to your integrity? Job was an integrable man. He hung on to his relationship with God. I understand Job's wife. We really cite and, and, and kind of put Job's wife down, but I kind of understand her. She'd given birth to seven sons and three daughters. She'd birthed 10 children for Job. She'd birthed her love of her children came out of her relationship with her husband. Now all of her children were gone. She was grieving as much as Job, only Job's posture in the grief was different than his wife's. His wife said, curse God and die. Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And the Bible says at the end of chapter 2, in all this, Job never blamed God. Our tendency is to blame God. But Job never blamed God. And he said, let me read it to you. Job chapter 2, verse 10. And he said, she, well, let me back up to verse 9. And his wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Are you still going to be a man of honor and integrity? Curse God and die. She was probably a little frustrated with Job at the time. And he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speak. Shall we indeed accept good from God and shall we not accept adversity? Wow. We in our nation have come to a point in our relationship with God that we want the blessing. But when the hard times come, we tend to turn away from God. The Bible says when we turn away from God, and it says it this way at the end of verse 10, and all this Job did not sin with his lips. Job did not blame God. Job had the concept whether I have abundance or whether I have little, whether I abound or whether I abase, has nothing to do with my relationship with God. Everything in my life is based from God and has come from God. Well, this morning I want to speak to you about spiritual warfare again. But let's break our text down. Turn with me back to Isaiah. Chapter 
43. And let me just read the first two verses. But now this says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and informed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you and called you by your name, and you are mine. Aren't you glad you belong to God this morning? When you, when, underline when, not if. When you pass through the rivers, I'll be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, neither shall the flame scorch you. God said, when you pass through. Not if you pass through, but there's another meaning of the word when. It doesn't mean only that you're going to go into a trial. It means when you pass through. You see, God's intent is never to leave you in the hardships of life. God's intent is that you go through the hardships of life. And what is the intent of God bringing us into times of hardship and removing his hand of blessing? It's so that in the valley, we learn the lessons of the valley that will lead us back into the mountaintop. God never intended you to live the destiny and, and entirety of your life in valleys of depression and despair. Yet too many in our nation, too many in the world today are living their life having chased the things of God more than chasing after God. And the blessing of God is not resting on them. The blessing of God is not the accumulation of what I have. The blessing of God is my relationship with him. I told you that I'm building an old car, and I've been pretty done building it for a while. There's a lot more that needs to be done, but I'm pretty done. I came to the point of realizing, like everything else, that's going to belong to someone else. The things that I have of God, I've learned a long time ago, and I hope you learned the lesson with me, to hold loosely. Because Job was absolutely right. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I've learned the lessons in the valley. And the valley's lessons lead me to the mountaintop. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean everything's going to go good in your life. I know guys that preach that. They say, well, if you're having problems, you got a bad relationship with God. Your relationship, as a Christian, you should never have a problem. Do you know that Jesus learned obedience through the things he suffered? Though a son, yet he learned obedience through the things he suffered. Do you know that it says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, there are going to be valleys in your life that are going to determine lessons that will lead you and guide you into the mountaintops of your life. I've learned a long time ago, I have to go through the valley. I'm not going to stay there, but I have to go through it in order to get to the mountain on the other side. I want to learn the lessons of the valley. And so there are times that God blesses me and there are times that the Lord takes back from me. But at all those times, I still am able to say, blessed be the name of the Lord. I think about David the Bible says in in 1 Samuel chapter 13 that David was a man after God's own heart. David walked with God. David learned the presence of God as he was tending his father's sheep. And it said a lion or a bear would attack the sheep and David would destroy them and kill them and protect the sheep. David learned the presence of God. David wrote two-thirds of the Psalms. He didn't write every Psalm, but he wrote the vast majority of the Psalms. The Psalms were his worship to God. The Psalms were not so much poetry as they were worship. And, jo and David was worshiping God as he wrote the Psalms. David faced all kinds of problems in his life. But he didn't face them because he was doing wrong though he did some wrong things. But he faced them so that God could teach him in the valley of his life and enable him to go to the next pinnacle of his life. We need to hear this message this morning that there are going to be valleys in your life and because you're a Christian doesn't mean everything is going to be wonderful and blessed and easy and good and everything will be fine. 
there will be valleys. But in the valley, I learn the lessons that lead me to the mountain. My life is comprised of mountains and my life is comprised of valleys. David, though he loved God and served God with all of his heart, found that King Saul, who was insanely jealous of David, began to chase after David. So David was now living in a cave. He is forced to leave his land. He is forced to leave his home. He is forced to leave his family. And he's off living in a cave. Because King Saul, do you know there are times that other people's problems will come and plague you? Mm -hmm. David never retaliated against Saul. Though Saul threw javelins at him and did all kind of things in his insanity, David continued to stand firm. And the message to you in this church this morning is stand still in the face of adversity. Bow your head and worship God and don't try to get back and don't try to get vengeance. The Bible says vengeance is mine and I will repay. So my posture is to serve God. David was running from Saul. He was running to to save his life. I think of the Apostle Paul. I think of the hardships that he suffered. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 lists a whole bunch of things that Paul went through. He went through one trial after another. He learned the lessons in the trials that brought him to the mountains. The difference between David and Paul and you and I is they learned that it's times of our life that we go into the valley are very important because there are lessons in the valley that can be learned no other way. You ever lost something? And you look back and you see that it was a blessing, that it was gone? I've done that more often than not. But what I'm learning is the lesson that Paul and David learned. They learned that God always delivers, but God's delivery isn't always fast. There was a man that had always wanted a barometer. And so one day he found a barometer in the store. It was like a thrift store probably. And he found a barometer in the store. And he went and he purchased the barometer. And when he got it home, he looked at the dial and found that it was stuck on hurricane. He began to knock on the barometer because the dial would not move. He began to beat on it and hit it and shook it vigorously All to no avail, the dial would not move. So being upset and frustrated and angry, he wrote to the store that he'd bought the barometer in, and he wrote a very hot, fiery letter. And the next day on his way to New York to to his office to work, he mailed the letter. As he mailed the letter, he felt a lot better for writing the angry hate letter to the company that had sent him the defective barometer. He was coming home that night. What's the, what's the island by New York? Staten Island. That's where he lived. As he got home, he found his barometer was gone. But then again, so was his house. The barometer was right. There was a hurricane coming. <laughs> there are times in our life that we went out. We think the barometer is broke. We shake it. But God is saying, no, my deliverance may not come as fast as you want, but my warnings are coming and my deliverance is there. I want you to know that God has a plan for our life. And the things I'm learning out of the book of Job that we've been speaking on is the, re- the, the blessing of God or the deliverance of God doesn't always come fast. Write that down. The deliverances of God don't always come fast. And if there's one thing we need to learn today, it's how God delivers his people. I want to share three things in the next two weeks with you about God's deliverance. But the first thing I want to talk to you about this morning is God's deliverance is seldom fast. In fact, it's almost in my life I'm finding never very fast. Because there are lessons that I need to learn in the hard times of life that will lead me to the next pinnacle of my life. 
The reason God doesn't deliver me is not because he's angry. You see, God didn't allow the enemy to take the things from Job because God was perturbed at Job. It had nothing to do with it. God allowed the enemy to take the things from Job so that Job would learn the lesson of the valley. And the lesson of the valley would lead him to the mountain. So when you lose things this morning, you need to rip your clothes, shave your head. Shave your head. You're just like Job, man. And Job, after he'd ripped his clothes, a sign of lamenting and mourning, shaved his head, a sign of mourning again, fell upon the ground, Job. <laughs> Yes, you're the mother. You can kick him now. <laughs> His mother said, now can I kick him? <laughs> Probably better not. Yeah. Job humbled himself, put his face to the ground in sackcloth and ashes, and humbled himself before God and said, God in the valley, I'm not looking at what I've lost. I'm looking at you. Would you bring me up Again, Job was not saying, bring me back to blessing. Job was saying, bring me up again to you. Let my eyes not be on the loss of things. Let my eyes be on the giver and blesser of all my life. Job learned lessons in the valley that elated and elevated him back to a mountaintop. There will be mountains in your life. There will be valleys in your life. But I'm not looking at the things of possessions in my life. I'm looking at my relationship with God. Job's posture at the end of chapter 1 and in verse 9 and 10 of chapter 2 are the same in both cases. Job had lost all his things. He was now broke. He was now childless. And his wife was coming up to him now. He has boils. And he said, she says, curse God and die. But Job says, no, can I not accept good and accept bad and still bless God? Whether I have abundance or whether I have lack, God is still God. The possessions that I have do not equate to my relationship with God. They're, they're, they're not more important to me than God. So Job says, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. The Lord giveth. We've got that part down really well. And the Lord taketh away. Whether I have or whether I don't have does not change who God is. Job, David, Paul all learned the lessons of the valley and the lessons of the valley brought them to the mountaintop. I want to tell you one more illustration the life of Joseph. How many of you have ever studied Joseph? Jo Joseph was an amazing man. Joseph's life was a life of hardship and a life of victory all at the same time. Joseph was the third generation from Abraham. Abraham's name, or through Abraham, the children of Israel were birthed and born. God had a plan for Joseph. But in order for Joseph's plan to come to fruition, God had to cause some things to happen to Joseph. He was the youngest son of Jacob at least at the time, Benjamin, who was born later in life, became the youngest son. Joseph was a dreamer. Joseph was a worshiper of God, but Joseph may have had a little problem with self-elevation. At least it appears so to me. Joseph would come to his brothers and say, I see you bowing down to me. And in fact, that did happen. But the brothers didn't like it. Joseph was daddy's favorite. Daddy had made him a coat of many colors. And the boys see Joseph coming from afar off as they're tending the father's sheep. And they say, there's the dreamer. There's, let's, let's kill him. Let's kill him. So as Joseph approaches the, the boys, the, the other ten boys' sons, as he approaches them, <clears throat> they say, let's kill him. Reuben intervenes. 
and they put Joseph in a pit. And they begin to eat their lunch. And as they look up, it says that they saw a herd of a caravan coming toward them of merchants who were headed to Egypt to trade their goods. And they said, let's make some money off of this boy. Instead of just killing him, let's sell him. And let's sell him to the merchants and let the merchants take him to Egypt and we'll be done with him. We'll kill a, a sheep and we'll put the, blood, the sheep blood on the coat of many colors and we'll take the coat back to dad and we'll tell dad, is this your son's coat? We don't know what happened to him. We don't know where he went. And so that's exactly what they did. The caravan bought Joseph, who is now about, thir- about 17 years old. They brought Joseph and sold him in Egypt to a man named Potiphar, who was the general or commander of the Pharaoh's army. Potiphar made Joseph a slave. So Joseph goes from being number one in the house to being a slave in the house in a foreign land. Joseph is under the tutelage of Potiphar. Potiphar had a hot wife. And Mrs. Potiphar, Potsy's wife, began to look at Joseph with bad intentions. And that's all I'm going to say about that. She laid hold of Joseph's coat as she told him to come lie with her. Joseph said, no, I'm a man of God. I'm a man of integrity. I worship God. God tells me not to do this strange thing. Joseph fled but he left joseph had a problem with coats joseph let his arms back and his coat go potiphar comes home mrs potiphar says to potiphar that boy that you hired to be a household servant tried to have his way with me and so potiphar becomes angry he throws joseph in jail joseph is now in jail joseph gets out of jail by interpreting a dream for the king, but Joseph spent years in jail. Let me look at my facts because I want you to see the amount of time that Joseph was blessed by living with his father compared to the amount of time that Joseph went into bondage. Joseph was 17 when he was sold into slavery in Egypt. At 17, he went to prison. He stayed in prison 13 years before he interpreted the Pharaoh's dream. So now 13 and 17, he's 30 years old. He'd spent almost half of his life in a prison in a foreign land for crimes that he did not commit. There were seven years of plenty, and there were two more years of famine before Joseph's brothers came to him in Egypt. Remember I told you that Joseph said, I see you bowing down to me. Joseph had been made number one under under the Pharaoh. He was number one in the land. The brothers now, some 22 years had passed. The last time they saw him, he was 17 years old. Joseph had changed. Joseph had learned the language of the land. Joseph was dressed in the clothes of the land, and his hair was the style of the land. They didn't recognize him. His voice had changed. His countenance had changed. His clothing had changed. Everything about him had changed. They didn't recognize him. And as they came to him for food, for grain to take back to their land, Joseph recognized them. Joseph is saying... How is this coming to pass as 22 years of prison have come between me and the plan of God? But Joseph remembered the dream. He remembered that his brothers would bow down, and lo and behold, that's exactly what had happened. 22 years had passed. But do you know that God had a plan all the time for Joseph? God gave Joseph dreams and visions of what was going to come. And it came. Have you had dreams and visions of things that God has shown you? I want to tell you some of them are beginning to come to pass even today. 
Joseph said, you're going to bow down. That's exactly what had happened. For 22 years, Joseph had to be in a bad spot in order to learn the lessons of adversity so that he could sing the songs on the top of the mountain. Do you know what that adversity birthed in Joseph? It birthed integrity and it birthed honor to God. Joseph, and you know the story, but Joseph gives the the grain to his brothers. They take it back to the father. It's a long story, but let me skip through that until the end comes. Genesis chapter 50, go with me. Genesis chapter 50, the, the boys come back for more grain to take back to Israel. And Joseph reveals himself to them. Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20. The brothers are repentant. They're sorry. And Joseph responds to them. But you meant evil against me. But God meant good. Underline that verse. You meant evil against me, but God meant good in order to bring about as it is this day, to save many people alive. Can I tell you that sometimes God will bring you into valleys so that he can bless you and your family and your family's family and their family's family and another generation and another people? The blessings of God make rich, but the blessings of God are best learned in the valleys of life. Joseph was in prison for 22 years, or he was away from his family for 22 years. All the things that he'd went through for the first 17 years of his life were removed. He's in prison. He's a slave in another man's house. But God had to bring him in to the valley, watch now, to bring him out to the mountain. And when Joseph came out of the valley of 22 years of tribulation, The blessing of God not only rested on Joseph, but he was reunited with his father and he met his younger brother Benjamin and his brothers did bow down and and pay homage to him. But not only that, the whole nation of Israel was blessed. Wow. Sometimes the slight tribulation, which is but for a moment, works a far more exceeding weight of glory in me. Can I say that again? The slight tribulation is but for a moment. But I will come out of the moment of tribulation. And there will be an elation that is better than anything I've ever seen in my life. I live, we live, you live in a hard and trying day. Everything around you is changing. We're moving as a nation into a time of tribulation and despair. We're living as people in a hard time. But let me tell you, God is using the hard time to bring us into the good time. My good time is not looking for life here. My good time is looking for eternity there. I'm looking for the things that I'm going through now to prepare me for what I'm about to receive. I'm looking for my family to be blessed. I'm looking for the nation to be blessed. I'm looking for the hand of God to move upon the people of God. I'm looking for the church to be united and strengthened. The trying of our faith produces steadfastness. Let me say it again. This light tribulation, which is but for a moment, works a far more exceeding weight of glory in me. I don't know what you're going through, but I'm not going to pray God bring you out. I'm going to pray that you learn the lessons of the valley. The first lesson of God's deliverance is it's not usually very fast. Not because God is slow, but because he wants us to learn the lessons in the valley. The lessons of the valley will elevate you to the mountains of elation. But you have to go through the valley. There's no shortcut to get to the mountain. God's not punishing you in the valley. The enemy may rob you to get your eyes on the loss of things, but we're not going to look at the loss because it'll drop down into my spirit. 
we're going to fall down before God and worship Him. And He, let me close with this, is the same God of the mountain, is the same God in the valley. Whether you're in an abundance or whether you're in lack, God of the mountain, the blessing, is also God in the valley, the hard time. I have to go into the valley in order to get onto the mountain. Though he slay me, Job said, yet will I trust him. Can I only take good from God or can I also take the hard times from God? The hard times of my life, as I look back over my life, were the times that I was closer to God than in the times of blessing. When I get blessed by God, my eyes tend to look at the blessing. When I'm having hard times, my eyes tend to turn to God. I'm telling you this morning, turn your eyes upon Jesus. He's the author and finisher of your faith. Mountains and valleys, oh, my friend, they're going to come and go in your life forever and ever until you die. But the mountains and the valleys will determine where you spend eternity. I'd like you to bow your heads with me for a moment. <clears throat> Psalm 40, and I made a, let me read it to you. In verse 1 to 3, our text that we chose this morning says this. I waited patiently. In the Hebrew it says, in waiting, I waited. I waited patiently. Are you waiting for a blessing of God? Don't be in a hurry. Wait patiently. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. Listen. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit in the miry clay. Out of that he set my feet upon a solid rock. Jesus is the rock. He established my steps. You're beginning to move. And he put a new song in my mouth, even a song of praise, and many will see it in fear and put their trust in the Lord. People are watching you this morning. If you're in a valley, worship God. If you're on the mountain, worship God. He's the God of the mountain, but he's also the God of the valley. I have to go through the valley to get to the mountain. Through it all, my eyes are on him. Job taught us a lesson, whether I abound or whether I base, whether the Lord gave or whether he takes away, blessed be his name. God loves you. No good thing will he withhold. But let me teach you a lesson. The valleys are not bad things. They're learning grounds that lead us to the mountains. Father, I pray that you'd be glorified in this house this morning. I pray we'd learn the lessons of the valleys that we might go to the mountains. Lord, that you would gather us to yourself, that we'd hold loosely the blessings of God, that we might hang tightly to the presence of God. Lord, teach us to hold loosely the blessings and hang tight to the presence. And we give you honor and praise. We give you glory, for you have might and dominion. 